back with you. Sorry, stepped away for a minute, and we're about to begin shortly. Okay. Добрый день, уважаемые коллеги, дорогие друзья. Hello, dear colleagues and dear friends. We're about to begin our event today. The presentation of the book by Michael Carley, Stalin's Risky Game, Looking for Allies Against Hitler, 1930, 1936. Before giving the floor to the distinguished author, to Michael, I'd like to uh, give a brief introduction. Back in December 2019, almost five years ago, we already heard one of the presentations of Michael's book, Secret War West versus Russia, 1917, to 1930. Back then, Michael was able to personally take part in presenting his work. We were very gladdened to see him within the walls of the Russian Historical Society. Today, five years past, we are conducting a presentation of his new edition, his latest book, in Russian. It's great to see that a number of Michael's books were translated into Russian and are available to domestic researchers. The book we're talking about today, all of the books, all of his books are marked with a great uh, variety of sources using archives, Russian, American, French. This is uh, a strong advantage of these books, which sets it apart from all the other literature. Certainly, the edition in Russian will enrich our historical literature. More personally, myself, as a historian uh, on civil war, intervention period. I remember well and using my practice the book that came to light in Montreal in 83. This was the first monography written by Michael Carley, The Revolution and Intervention French Government and Civil War in Russia. And I may only thank him for the huge body of work he had done back then and also for his new books in particular the work we are presenting today. Wrapping up my short introduction, I'd like to give the floor to Michael himself, who joined us online today. Greetings, Michael. We are very happy to see and hear you, sir, despite online on screen. You have the floor. You may speak. Thank you very much. Uh, hello, Vladimir. Kagdala. I'm, uh, it's uh, morning here in uh, Montreal. Um, so I'm uh, bound to uh, greet you with a good morning. I see familiar faces amongst you. 
uh, colleagues and uh, and fellow academics. I'm speaking to you from my small study at home. I'm very sorry I can't be with you today, but uh, it's gotten very hard for an old grandpa, an old grandpa like me, to travel from North America to the uh, Russian Federation and has to go to Istanbul or Qatar, of all places, with poor connections to Moscow. I want to say, first of all, that I am deeply honored by the interest uh, you have shown in the Russian translation of volume one of my uh, trilogy. It's no small thing to be invited to the Rio to participate in, a, participate in a discussion of my work. I don't know quite what else to say. In comparison, I'm often shunned and shadow banned in the West. Fyodor uh, Borisovich, uh, my Russian editor and my colleague and friend, Veronika Yuryevna, have asked me to offer a few comments about my trilogy, which deals with Soviet foreign policy and the origins and early conduct of the Second World War and the Great Patriotic War, roughly from 1930 to 1941 or the beginning of 1942. The Russian uh, volume one was uh, published last April, but the English volume, English language volume two was also published at the same time and is now being translated into Russian. The English volume three is in production and I expect to receive uh, uh, first proofs in early November with publication in the spring of 2025. Hence, the complete English version of the trilogy will soon be published. I first became interested in the history of Russia and the Soviet Union when I was an undergraduate student. I was fascinated by the medieval princes of Kiev and Rus, but especially by the great leaders of the Russian Revolution. Remember, it was the 1960s and the middle of the civil rights and anti-war movements in the United States, and at the same time, the 50th anniversary of the Great Russian Revolution. One of my professors suggested I write a fourth-year paper on the French intervention in the Russian Civil War, which I, which I did. I was 22 years old at the time. Eventually, I wrote my doctoral thesis on that topic. I spent more than two years in Paris doing research. The thesis became a book uh, published, as you noted, in 1983 and was recently translated into French and published in Paris also last November, uh, last, uh, last April. After that, I transitioned in Soviet foreign policy and relations uh, with the Western powers. Then in the early 1990s, the Soviet archives opened more or less, and I made my first trips to uh, Moscow. My Russian, my Russian editor asked me how I came to write my three volumes on Soviet foreign policy. The truth is that I intended to publish a single volume, but I kept writing a chapter after chapter, ending up with a typescript of over 2,000, 2,000 pages. Looking back, I don't, know, I don't know how I managed it. No publisher would touch the manuscript at that length, so I divided it into three. What makes my books unique, I think, is in the Western world, is my extensive use of Soviet archives, along with those of France, Britain, the United States, amongst others. When I say Soviet archives, I mean, of course, the foreign policy archives in Moscow on the Plotnikov Periulok. I became fascinated by the Soviet diplomatic papers and went back again and again for more files to construct my narrative of the inner warriors. 
everyone has their stories about working in the Mead archives, both Russian and foreign historians. All in all, the archivists treated me decently. I used to complain about not seeing enough files, but an archivist there told me once that I was doing all right. I would also add that the Russian archives have done good work in making available online many important documents on foreign policy. I've consulted these online papers extensively. Uh, the Soviet documents, in my, in my opinion, are so important that I don't think you can now write about the origins of the Second World War without consulting them. In the archival files, one meets the first generation of Soviet diplomats, an interesting group of people who come back to life, I hope, in the pages of my books. They were the same age as our grandparents and perhaps your great-grandparents, many, many of you anyway. They were pragmatic, skillful diplomats, good at their jobs, stalwart defenders of Soviet national interests. They were largely wiped out during Stalin's purges. This is a tragedy that, which I describe in volume two of my trilogy. I like to say to my students at university that to become a good historian of international relations, you have to be able to put yourself in the shoes of the other. It's even better, of course, of course, if you actually like the actors of your narrative. Above all, one needs to tell their story based on the archival record, honestly, without the intrusion of personal ideological prejudices. These days in the Western world, that's not an easy thing to do. In fact, I think my English language publisher, the University of Toronto Press, has stuck its neck out to publish me. I've learned a lot from my archival researches. The West feared and hated the Bolsheviks so much so that I call the period from 1917 to 1941 the first stage of the Cold War, the second stage beginning in 1945. An analysis of Soviet policy toward the West is complicated, especially in the 1920s. But what struck me about Soviet diplomacy was how pragmatic it became, especially in the 1930s after Hitler took power in Germany. What happens in my picture? Excuse me. Uh, I continue. Maxim Maximovich Lidrinov was the narcom at the uh, Commissariat for Foreign Affairs, and he worked closely with Joseph Stalin. Their, their relationship is, is quite interesting. In fact, there are many examples in my work of how they interacted in formulating policy. By the way, I find that Stalin did not, did not prioritize relations with Nazi Germany. He supported collective security and mutual assistance until it became impossible to do so any longer. The Soviet Union was committed to resistance against Nazi Germany, as opposed to the Western powers, which were not. Many Western historians claim that Litvino pursued a personal policy. Stalin went along reluctantly preferring privileged relations with Nazi Germany. In fact, that is not true as far as I can have been able to determine that Vino's policy was Soviet policy, was Soviet policy. Can you imagine anyone pursuing a personal policy contrary to Stalin's in the 1930s? <clears throat> this interesting fact comes at as a shock to most Western readers, 
In fact, it might even irritate some Russian colleagues. In the archives, you can follow the Western great and not so great powers as they drifted away from the USSR, one after the other, between 1934 and 1936. In August 1936, the USSR found itself largely isolated and in an increasingly dangerous environment in Europe and Asia. Of course, Poland was a special case and was never attracted to Soviet collective security. One can, what can one say? Uh, what can one say about Poland? I've characterized it as a skunk in the word woodpile of collective security. At the conclusion of volume one in the summer of 1936, Soviet policy had failed. Though the USSR did not abandon <coughs> all hopes for Soviet Western cooperation until three years later, that of course is part of the narrative of, of volume two. Litvinov said publicly in December 1933 that the Soviet Union could not alone pursue a policy of mutual assistance against Nazi Germany. It needed the help of the Western powers. Unfortunately, Litvinov's message never got across to Western governing elites, although there were exceptions to the rule, like Churchill, de Gaulle, the Romanian Titulescu, for example. They were white crows, a metaphor coined by the Soviet pulpit in Paris. The overriding themes of volumes one and two is that the Soviet Union was the only country in the 1930s truly committed to organizing collective security and mutual assistance against Nazi Germany. Volume three covers the interregnum in Soviet policy between September 1939 and the end of 1941 or the beginning of 1942 when the Grand Alliance came into being. Perhaps we can discuss that period on another occasion. Long ago when I published my first book on the French intervention and the Russian Civil War, I remember complaining to my former thesis supervisor that my work was being criticized. He tried to be reassuring. I never, I never, <clears throat> I'm quoting him here, he said, not to worry, many enemies means much honor. I've never let my work be influenced by pressures to conform to received uh, ideas in the West. I follow the archival trail, so to speak, come what may. Anyway, I think I've spoken uh, enough now, and thanks again to everyone uh, for your interest in my work. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michael. It was very interesting to listen to you, to hear your work, about your work on the publications. And of course, we are aware of your principal position when conducting your research. For this reason, I think your research are so widely and deservedly respected both in Russia and internationally. I hope that today we are in for an interesting discussion about the new edition, about the era dis described. And first of all, I'd like to give the floor to Veronika Yurevna Kroshenivnika, general manager of the Institute of uh, External Political Studies and Initiatives. She was the one who came forward with the initiative of uh, presenting your publication. We are very happy we'll be 
to have your second presentation in the Russian Historical Society. And now, Veronica, you have the floor. Dear Ruslan Grigorievich, dear Professor Carly, dear colleagues, thank you very much uh, to the wide Russian uh, Historical Society for setting up this discussion. We'd like to also thank the Foundation uh, Russia Homeland for supporting this publication well michael i'd like to congratulate you with uh, your new with your publication with discussion in these walls uh, this important presentation since we have communicated frequently i'm aware how much work has gone into your books please correct me if i'm wrong i think it can be considered life's work since all of the books articles historical events you're describing it became part of that uh, historical chronicles and analysis starting with 17 to 1941 ruslan grigorievich mentioned your previous book also discussed here back in 2012 the secret war and dear colleagues please note how systemic and uh, informative is Professor Carlay's review of that period from 1918 to 1940, from 1917 to 1941. It's not just a fundamental story of relationships between Soviets and the West, but the story of uh, counteraction of the West, um, open, covert uh, ways to the policies of Soviet Russians, uh, Soviet Union. Please uh, correct me if I am wrong. Perhaps there is another story published in the West, but I've never heard of it. Perhaps you will find another author if you look hard. Now, obviously, to prepare such a huge uh, work, years, it took years of efforts. You have probably spent more years in the archives than the years spent right, actually writing. Well, Ruslan has mentioned it already. Not many historians in the West today have the backbone and the courage to do their job without disregarding the ideological framework imposed. It's uh, hard to imagine how difficult it is to work in isolation, but uh, representing historical truth also gives own impetus. The uniqueness of this book, this trilogy, was already noted. The fact that author uh, goes into the archives of all of the stakeholders, brings together all of the data, all of the opposing opinions, presenting a gigantic picture dynamic picture is a huge achievement certainly another important trait of this work is that style author's uh, narrative style that uh, lets you deep dive back in history you wrote beautiful portraits of uh, soviet diplomats beginning with mr litminov uh, a real life really detailed portraits not just as an official as a minister but also as a man how intense the work was back then also i'd like to thank Fyodor borisovich Glebo, our long time colleague and executive uh, manager of puchkova pole publishing house we've been um, cooperating since 2018 in the real politics series back in 2012 2014 we also published our first works and they contain a lot of information which was later needed and these books were uh, certainly uh, prolific uh, let's read these books let's read quality history history has all the answers to the questions we are facing today michael congratulations once again thank you very much dear veronica 
I think we'll all join in the words of congratulations. And for the next address, giving the floor to Andre Hazin, director of Russia State Social University, academician of the Russian Academy of Arts, the member of the Council of the Russia Historical Society. The history of the university headed by Andre is uh, closely related to the history of Comintern, to the plots raised in your books. Michael, I think that Andre will give us an interesting address, which will also cover the role of his university. Thank you. Thank you, dear friends. Thank you, Ruslan. It is certainly important to have regular meetings in the Russian Historical Society that provide new impetus of energy for research, new views of outstanding international scientists, scholars, also the books by our compatriots, our countrymen. We see many works written based on archives. It's an important trend. Unfortunately, most part of contemporary literature is not based on any factual truth or historical archives. This is one of the most important uh, points in the work of Russian Historical Society. We truly welcome fundamental sciences, fundamental science in our work, in history. Our university, founded 105 years ago as Sverdlov's University, then became party school, was in a thick of events the book covers. As you know, within the walls of our university, over a dozen people worked that became heads of state in their countries. Comintern at the time was one of the most energetic and active f fighters with Nazism. We need to remember that Comintern was headed back then by Georgi Dimitrov, that during the late speak trial back in 33 has achieved his first and most powerful widely known victory over Nazism. This was amazing, and he was one of the people who continued this work to the very end of his life, which followed quite early in 49. I'd like to note the work conducted by Russian leadership headed by Stalin in these years had some similarities in the preceding Russian centuries, Russian history. I think that the periods when continental warfare occurred, which could lead to the loss of national sovereignty, statehood of big European countries, French, UK, France, UK, Prussia, which later developed into German Empire, also the Holy Roman Empire in the part which could call the Austro-Hungarian Empire. These states, when we're talking about the possible loss of statehood, were always our allies. It's amazing. Speaking of UK, for instance, look at the Napoleonic First Second World War. We were also allies. But as soon as we're talking about our country uh, exercising influence in European and international processes, immediately this uh, allied relations transformed into open or covert competition down to intervention. Crimea war, Crimean war, others. 
as was written in 1948 by young French Joseph who licked Baskevich's boots and then armed neutrality troops on the border Prussia uh, they were the same family with Russian emperors also adopted a um, hostile position to Russia in the three military theaters including Far East Caucasus and Crimea saw direct intervention by UK France Ottoman Empire in two of these theaters we achieved full history St. George orders first and second grade were each first second class were awarded for Petro defense of Petro Pavlovsk Caucasus also presented some highlights then similar situation happens during the First World War where through the efforts of Alexander III and Russian diplomacy we saw what became Antanta by the First World War June 17 monarchy overthrown temporary government and Antanta has taken a decision for Bosphorus and Antanta to be assigned to Russia and when the Axis were already, the central powers were already defeated, it was only the question of time. They had no more resources to continue warfare. At that time, our allies, first of all, English, uh, really reversed the, the, the process and began actively working to uh, try and achieve collapse in Russia which they succeeded to a point even in the years where we were formal allies with the uk this was uh, uh, difficult allied relations the british at the time were following their own national interest in our opinion it wasn't partnership like next important story related to the background of these talks and diplomatic efforts is the Vienna Congress it got to absurd I remember a funny incident during the visit before during the visit of Mitternick to London before the opening of the Congress he gave golden fleece to the Prince Regent Spanish heritage before breaking up into two branches whole history of Austrian branch of golden fleece not one non not a single non-catholic was awarded that except for that notable exception why because Prince Regent George the fourth future George fourth uh, loved external trappings it was a type of bribe uh, incentive and this made him published uh, there were published instructions who were very well known despite his limited uh, influence on policy when Alexander the first wanted to give him the golden fleece they said he is not Catholic he is Orthodox and then what about George that was the question this uh, really characterizes the history of our relationship with Western countries today they love remembering Molotov Ribbentrop Pact but we have to remember that it was the last in the long line of similar treaties by European countries with Hitler and I'd like to recall Hitler's reaction I remember the worms in Brook in München he said I think that's the essence even Poland Michael mentioned today we asked for a corridor 
uh, for our troops to protect Czechoslovakia. But no, Poland uh, preferred to become an aggressor in the next part of Czechoslovakia at, uh, after Munchen Accords. So Poland became a victim of aggression next, after the beginning of the Second World War, Abyssinia annexion was earlier, despite that. So we recall that this movement, this um, events that ended up in um, the war, in the Second World War, were very complicated and uh, sometimes forced. The documents, in particular the ones Michael mentioned, uploaded, suggest that nobody in the USSR, including Stalin, counted on, no, on avoiding the war. It was obvious the war will come. The question was how to delay it. In my opinion, uh, these uh, amazing efforts which were undertaken by Russian diplomats headed by Stalin led to the fact, led to, well, first of all, it was very difficult to evacuate industry from occupied zone. But there was electric power generation. There were power sockets, I'm sorry for simplifying. And if we had another year, we were able, we'll be able to build much more industrial power capacity. This was the result of the lengthy delay of the war. Certainly it was difficult. It was sometimes degrading, but it did happen. It's very important today that we see a book written by a man who understands the need of Soviet leadership actions and understands that we were certainly the last to enter formal agreement with Hitler. And certainly when they say that we took part in splitting Poland, I think I'd like to know that we achieved, we, we were focusing on internationally recognized uh, Soviet borders, illegally occupied by Poland lands and uh, Lvov, for instance, was left as a Jewish. Uh, being Jewish, I'd like to note that if we hadn't done that, uh, many more hundreds of thousands of Jewish people who would not be able to evacuate from the Soviet zone would have died during German occupations, including my family. So. I'd like to also thank Michael for this book to be written um, without bias, based on archives. And these important motivations of Soviet lead governments and Stalin were dictated by the need to create industrial base and capacity for such large-scale war. Michael accounted, uh, understood that, uh, noted that, and uh, we may attend, read it carefully and see some interesting new conclusions and arguments. Thank you so much. I'm sorry for the sorry for the protracted uh, speech. Thanks very much, Andre. Before moving the floor to the next speaker, dear colleagues, we have many speakers. Please uh, stay limited to five minutes speeches. Yes, Sergei, you have the floor. The head of a center on uh, researching history of Great Patriotic War Institute of Russian History, Russian Academy of Sciences. Dear Michael, uh, I'd like to congratulate you with a publish with this with this uh, latest book. I've read it earlier on, and I'd like to note it's a very rare book for more than. Uh, 
Western history. This type of plots are no longer fashionable. And to find a large modern monography on 20th century diplomacy with such a huge number of sources is a rarity. It's very difficult to write these books. To analyze the problems Professor is describing, I certainly would like to take my hat off to you, Michael. It's your life's work. All the archives in all of these countries visiting them, huge labor, huge work. The books. Michael, I'd like to congratulate you because all of your publications in Russia, they are same quality as you see at home. I think they're very good quality and they're very easy to read. And I think uh, all of the present company has to understand due to current relations the publishing of this book and Michael's position certainly an act of courage is an act of courage such people as Professor Carly and other uh, historians are being threatened constantly their families their children especially in Canada you know how many uh, Ukrainian expats live there so Michael is a very courageous historic and like an icebreaker uh, sailing these uh, waters writing what he feels right when i read the book i thought whether soviet diplomats of the era would have liked it if they read it and i think the soviet uh, diplomats would have liked it i'm not sure of stalin stalin didn't like his thoughts being discussed yeah he, he used to say that if a diplomat says what he thinks, he's not a diplomat. But I think Sokolnikov, Litvinov, Rakovsky, Raskolnikov and many others would have certainly liked the book. But the French and English probably wouldn't have liked it at all. So congratulations. Thank you. Thank you, dear Sergey. Not one historical piece of research is possible without archive sources, without uh, going to documents. I'd like our archive to speak next. Andrei Romanov, head of the Archive External Policy Russian Federation. Good afternoon, dear Michael. It is great pleasure to welcome you sincerely. I'd like to give you the floor from all of the team of the Archives Policy in Russian Federation. Without being too modest, I'd like to say that you are one of our most favorite loved researchers. The point is, uh, as a man, as a long-term researcher, I'd like to say, when you select uh, documentation for research, it's a huge dilemma. You don't know what the person is like and how they will use it. You're not sure of the consequences of your actions. And I'd like to say that according to many years of cooperation between you and the archives, Russian Federation, a full mutual understanding has been achieved. Frankly speaking, the heart of the archive worker starts beating faster when you see some researchers achieve a hundred percent, in your case, hundred and fifty percent, considering the range of sources used for your research. I'd like to once again congratulate you with the Russian publication of your book. We're always uh, eager to welcome you, hoping to see you soon. 
And to wrap up, I'd like to also thank the public publishing house, Kuchkova Poly, that is also our partner, as Sergei said, for great quality of their publications for of that book we see here today. Thank you very much, dear Andre. One of the largest compositions of Soviet era documents on the different eras is the Russian social archive political history. Next speech goes to Andre Sorokin, scientific advisor of this archive. Andre, you have the floor. Thanks very much for inviting me to take part in this important event. A special thank you to our author for the book. Um, I feel it's very important as a historian, as a publisher, and as an archive man. Back in 2007, we initiated Stalinism history project that saw over 250 books by Russian and international authors published. I see a huge rise in uh, international Staliniana, many thousands of case studies, articles, or monographies with all of the achievements of modern history. Historians have lost to politicians and systemizing the events of the era. The author of the book undertakes one of the few in modern historiography important attempts to systemize his perception of a range of events leading up to this historical process at the time, express them gradually and consecutively achieve conceptual conclusions which appear very timely and very well based and researched with most majority of these conclusions and the attention focused points made by our author, I completely agree. Stalin was certainly one of the authors and actors of the connected to the name of Litvinov. Nineteen thirties was the first stage of Cold War. Cooperation of great countries was a situational solution of problems facing international community at the time, owing to the beginning of the Second World War. Stalin personally advocated collective security. In a range of private conversations with the Soviet leadership. He repeatedly noted that he preferred alliance with the UK or France, not Germany. This could be discussed at length, but I'd like to highlight the importance of the book. New step conceptualization, systemization, external political doctrine, line, Soviet Union, Stalin personally at the time. Book presents an example of how important archival research is 
author's work seems to me is one of the outstanding cases of such work with archives i have to separately thank michael for what he said in his introduction when he thanked the russian archives and archives workers for providing documentary in data online certainly russian archives today both federal and inter-service are working in this direction great body of documents are available online digitalized well, and I do hope that this body of archives will become a barrier, an obstacle, on the way of um, unscrupulous politicians, publishers, who treat history based on own ideas and interpretations, not wanting to turn to archives a number of times. I used a special term I coined, archive absenteeism. That's what I call conscious unwillingness, not only by publishers, by professional, not only by writers, but professional historians to visit archives. It is difficult work. Certainly it takes visits to a whole range of archives. And we certainly honor such historians, include that Michael belongs to, that undertake such huge labor, such detailed, gritty work in the archives. Systemize, conceptualize only after focused research. Certainly, we cannot overlook the fact that Michael's book is dedicated to European theatre of external policy and future European military theatre. But to understand Soviet policy, Stalin policy for the period is impossible. We remember when Stalin spoke about the sources of imperialist war, about the hotspots, had never mentioned Europe as separated from international affairs. For in the European theatre, we have to remember Stalin's policies in Europe. Systematization, conceptualization, Soviet policy for East is very important. And the soft underbelly of Soviet Russia, Turkey, Caucasus, Central Asia, never dropped out of Soviet leaderships. Notice during both wars. Lots yet has to be done to understand the strategic line of Stalin and Soviet leadership. 
on providing for security. Recently, we have concluded a book. We hope this book will still be presented within the walls of Russia Historical Society. Any historian today it's important for them to be popular, to be well-known. Very important for historians. Now, Foundation Digital History joining us online, Егор Яковлев. Hello, dear colleagues. Hello, dear Michael. Many thanks for great work. Unfortunately, Western history is full with much less quality work we are discussing. Many work which pretends to be historical a falsification, like Sean McMicken, Stalin's War, uh, where the foreword was written, uh, uh, the comment was written by Michael Carley. It was full of fantasy to present to the main to present that Stalin and Soviet Union started the Second World War and he probably carries the main responsibility for the tragedy. Fortunately, there are also other works, such as Michael's work. It's very important that it was translated, and the Russian audience can also read it. For a long time, I have been researching Nazi crimes in the Soviet Union. This was closely related to German ideology of taking living space and Mein Kampf, German sword, German plow. But this subject is also being falsified actively, and the German war against the USSR is presented today as a defensive and forced due to aggressive actions by the USSR. We heard Viktor Suvorov theory that was published in the 40s. It was very popular in the 40s. But today it's important, based on uh, real facts, to deal with this anti scientific thesis. I think Michael Carter's book highlights that the threat of Nazi Germany was already conscious in back in 33. I read carefully all of the statements Michael quotes, statements by Soviet diplomats working with the German counterparts. It's clear how Litvinov and other diplomats were worried, concerned by Mein Kampf. This is where the theory was described, and Hitler wasn't shy pointing out what he saw as new living space for German nation, Russia specifically. Russian emigres in Europe also read Mein Kampf, and the theory of new living space is not only described there. After Nazi rise to power, 
highly placed, not just mentioned it publicly and privately. However, Russia immigration ignored these plans, preferring to consider it just lip service or just simply turning a blind eye. Soviet leadership couldn't afford to do that, and this was certainly expressed this aggression expressed in the official media led to attempts on creative collecting security in Europe. Today, I'd like to know separately that Michael's book is the best port presents best portrait of uh, best historical portrait of Litvinov. I haven't read anything better. A big thank you for that. Litvinov's, Litvinov was somehow lost against the background of Molotov. So developing on what Ruslan said, I will be very happy to welcome Professor Carly online. I'd love to present him to my audience at the Digital History Channel and on my radio show. I'd like to present his book to a wider audience. Thank you. Thanks very much, Igor. We'll be very happy to see you at our events. Certainly, why the audience is necessary. Any publication is impossible without the work of the author. And only saw the book. And also the work of the publishing house, the work is important. Not many scientific publications are left in Russia preparing such complex books. Now I'd like to give the floor to Fyodor Andreev, General Manager Kuchkova Poly Publishing House. Thanks very much, Ruslan Kikorovich. Dear colleagues, dear Michael, very happy to be here in a company of experts on international relations. Today, uh, The book was published in the series of Real Politics with the support of Foundation Homeland History. We are very grateful to all of the stakeholders. The series has already impacted on previous books. Munchen, 1938, the Abyss, no, 1939, formula. Sorry, we won't be able to interpret all of this accurately in real time, uh, Michael, because over 60 minutes are a bit burnt out and it's very, and it's really a lot of information, humanly impossible. I'll try to keep you in a loop of what is being said, just despite that. The book presented today, in my opinion, is a new book, a new page in diplomatic life, pre-war, developing actions, Germany beginning to express clear policy, a very masterful book, crescendo, plot, actors, very careful descriptions of all the stakeholders, greatly drawn historical personalities in the context of events. I think, as was mentioned earlier, 
he likes Litvinov and he highlighted his work for me as a publisher it's important to publish this type of analysis where the authors cannot be suspected of any bias considering the scope of data covered both in domestic and international archives this is a unique publication certainly it's something like encyclopedia of international policy politics in early 30s it's the first part of the trilogy second book 1936 to 1939 is now being uh, processed by our publishing house we hope to see it early next year third book yet has to be discussed Canada will soon see the print but I'm sure that it same along with other books of our distinguished author will be very successful and we're going to continue our work thank you so much thank you very much Fedor I think the plans will come to fruition and Russian historians will get these uh, translations now next Dmitry Bunevich advisor director Russian Institute strategic studies thanks for the opportunity to speak first of all congratulations to professor Carly all of us if you haven't read yet enjoyed the book please do it's a fundamental book Professor delicately mentioned difficulties in disseminating his research, his inf his work. I think these were difficulties at the outset of his scientific activity, his studies. Also today, we understand a man of his views um, is um, in a difficult, also in a controversial situation. How well does it? contrast with the thesis um, that was used to be practiced let's leave history to historians but today we know that western countries actually only propose this to us western countries never left history for historians it has always been full of politics they used uh, complex manipulations to promote certain his political narratives I saw noticed that Frankfurt now is holding one of the biggest book fairs the guild of German publishers gives an award to Anne Applebaum who is positioned as a historian the largest expert on European history and modernity I think for people in professional community it's clear uh, what kind of quality does the literature uh, she turns out it actually is but these people get Pulitzer's get the media coverage translations into dozens of languages today we're celebrating Professor Scully's book in Russian but Applebaum back in 15 saw translations in Russian and other languages. Unfortunately, our opponents have a system of broadcasting pseudo historical narratives, not only across historical societies, but in international public opinion. It's a well built system took decades to contrast since the Cold War and this type of books need publishing in Russian need support 
And we need uh, also award nominations because this book certainly deserves serious attention. Now, relationships with friendly countries. One of the biggest problems. India, China, Global South countries. We are still uh, looking at each other using Western views. And people from these countries wanting to explore the history are physically unable to get alternative viewpoints. For instance, person living in Brazil wanting to research Second World War and the role of the Soviet Union, he will only see the role of the USSR through Western narrative. Complete lies. And uh, we need to focus on process where we, our partners, can talk directly. And I think Professor Carly's book is a great case in point. Of possible discussion points, and not only here, but also in the countries where people want to understand what preceded Second World War. Not to just listen to official narratives. Scientific, pseudo-scientific, try to work it out themselves based on huge body of documents researched by Professor Carly over decades. So I think that inclusive discussion should be the focus, especially considering the fact that interest in history is rising worldwide. Andre here opened the book and saw the book Undivisible World, Indivisible World. I think it was the quotation from discussing the problems concerning Russian diplomacy. Even from these formulas, these collocations, we see how important this historical research is. Thank you so much. Thank you so much again. Thank you, Dmitry. We also have online colleagues joining us today. Vladimir Pichatny, International Relations University Professor. Thank you very much, dear colleagues. I must admit, it's a great book, great author. Lots has been said. I'd like to note that the publication of three volumes in an Anglo-Saxon world is a huge achievement. I'm, Sergei, I'm not even going to go into the courage issues, as Sergei correctly mentioned, but uh, this book is very hard to fight, even for its opponents. It went through blinds, uh, 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 not just by friendly, because people like Michael are a few and far between. And the book is printed, third book is ready. It's a recognition because it's very hard to find a similar book and it's hard to and this book is uh, irrevocable the documents speak for themselves i'm not and certainly the author has a rare empathy into the world of Soviet diplomacy in the 30s and has been lost another important advantage of the book is that michael brings it alive a whole range of bright Soviet diplomats come to life under his pen. Not just Litvina, but deputies, representatives that have done all the talks 
professionally, tenaciously, with enthusiasm, with belief that cooperation may still happen. There was a difference between positions of these people and position of Stalin and Molotov. They treated the West with more suspicion. Certainly they had more basis for that. Michael was right in saying that the fate of these people is clear. It's a tragedy. All of this human capital was destroyed, with few exceptions. They became redundant or even dangerous. Molotov used to say back in 1939, he said Litvinov covers people who are alien or hostile to Soviet policy. These people became so proficient and dangerous. And this is one of the reasons for their fight. But Michael giving them back to us as a team, as a group of people with a common agenda. He also gives us individual portraits, as Veronica said. These people are corruptiously resurrected from the past. And the practical significance of this work cannot be overestimated. We are already using the first and the second volume, the English volume in our new diplomatic history prepared by People's Rule of Bay Relations University. It's, this book is on the list of recommended literature to our students. Lost in archives. Quite often, colleagues complain about secrecy. We never used to have so much documents available. Archives are open and unused. Michael showed us the treasures available that our historians overlooked or used insufficiently. So the author gave a lesson not only to his Western colleagues, but to domestic, to Russian colleagues, who never bothered to dig deep. It requires huge energy and time. I understand. Speaking to archives, they admitted that Michael found documents that were a surprise to archive workers themselves. So, I think he brought significant value to the archives, once again highlighting the treasures hidden there on the dusty shelves. But in conclusion, I'd like to wish Michael, I know he is almost wrapped it up, it's certainly his life's work. We will eagerly expect the third volume in English and in Russian. I think it's very important for education of our audiences, professional and readers. Certainly we'd like to have big publications, big runs. Thank you. Thank you. 75 minutes. One of the people credited in the foreword, Vladimir Vladimirovich Semindye was mentioned. Let me give the floor to the head of research programs Foundation Historical Memory of Vladimir Vladimirovich. Thank you, thank you. The organizers, very happy to be here today. Opportunity. Seeing here, Michael, I remember our live meetings in Moscow, the impressions, magical impression that he place on the audience, certainly opportunity to work with Michael's text. Michael is a very demanding, very interesting author, it has to do with a book 
те хронологические рамки, которые framework covers key events I would mention League of Nations, century of Soviet Union. This was necessary, but in sufficient format. It was understood. It wasn't format wasn't working, but still Litvin of his team. Despite this being Stalin's team, they continued aimed for using all diplomatic resources not to prevent, but to delay the war. Succeeded, could have happened earlier, in 1939. Chinese colleagues have different opinion. Support the colleagues. Noting South Western focus our policy. Pact Molotov Ribbentrop Pact impacted not just the international communist movement but the fascist bloc. When you read Italian and other documents, you see the mistrust level towards Berlin after that was so high that Tokyo, Rome, and this provided for the further events development. Jabar Khalil, forest behind the trees, conceptual cover, coverage, Soviet policy will be used for preparing school curriculum, university curriculum in Russia. Thank you. Next, Alexander Naumov, deputy head, international problems, Moscow State University, soft power colored revolution center. Actually, I wanted to cut my introduction down to Moscow State University professor. It would have been enough. It's a great to see and for the first time to talk, first time with the dear professor. Very important work, very timely for a for number of reasons. First of all, it's very important today. Russia again is at the forefront with world hegemony, whatever we call it, American hegemony today. We see that. No. All Western historians are mostly focused on 1939, on the pact, saying this led to the war, which is not true. Three global lines for development of Versailles system were being developed at the time. <laughs> Certainly the lines were risky in some way, like collective security, but much more important and efficient in terms of success. 
less importance. With the appeasement policies. I'm very glad that our readers can read about this. It seems Professor confirms to geopolitical truth. Russia's response to external pressure exceeds that pressure and usually leads to destruction of this pressure instruments together with those implementing it. In Russia participation in international system cements balance of power. Anti-Russian basis will bring any system to a failure. That's what happened to Versal system, and I'm sure Professor will show us in the second volume. Very important today. I hope you don't give up, keep up the same tempo, and I think the book will be greatly demanded. And we are also going to make it popular. Александр Верчинин, historical faculty, Russia's State University. Michael, very happy to welcome you. Congratulations with your great monography. Certainly a huge event. It has some coverage. We haven't seen anything like it in the last 30 years. Bird's eye view of Soviet external policy, Soviet international foreign policy is missing generally. Opinions have been radicalized. Sean McMakin, not only one. Another John Don Haslam, British historian. What he wrote 40 years ago is different to what he writes today. In his recent book, Spectre Floor, Ghost Among Us brings us back to Cold War, saying that Soviet policy was completely ideological. However, he doesn't go as far as saying that Stalin wanted to attack Europe. Certainly, it's a huge feat, this book. We can fight it using archive, fight lies using archive documents. <clears throat> Nowhere else, no, in no archives I've been to, I failed to miss the big signature of Michael. Huge personal fit. Great scholar. Read it in both languages. Some plots are completely unknown to us, like Maisky's London 24 talks. It's that new. 1936 Soviet French military talks. Nothing on that. Do these documents have never come to light previously until now. Litvinov is a central person in the book, central character. 
Litvinov emerges not just as Stalin's uh, subordinate, but as a political figure. Certainly like-minded people conducting common policy, different tactically, own ideas, own views, certainly Litminov as a politician, independent, deserves notice. The book is a great introduction to this subject. Congratulations. Congratulations with this huge cause. We are eagerly expecting the other remaining books. It will become an important step in the struggle between international historiography. Thank you. Michael, you see how Russian scientists are walking down your steps in the archives as well retracing your steps so you're very well known yeah. Eskander Magadev, international relations institute congratulations professor carly professor perhaps uh, he can uh, comment on russian pronunciation of his name Carly or Carly, but regardless of that, uh, usually respected international historian, professor publishes in many leading publishing houses, publications, opinion, dissident, considered dissident, deflecting mainstream, it has a right to exist. Let us not forget Russian Historical Society. Take part in uploading documents online. Very important resource. Important that Professor highlights the difficult period the rise of Hitler to power French ambassador treated it much mildly they expected Hitler to be very mild disregarded Mein Kampf I think here we see more realistic raw understanding international reality optics Вершинин's book could also be mentioned in some ways it uh, we can see some parallels with this book professor carly's work is marked with live language it's like standing next to Litvin of stalin or other diplomats it's so such a deep dive into such an immersion into diplomatic routine. Another American historian, Professor Castillo, noted the importance of subjective understanding of USSR by American diplomatic staff. Professor Carly's book suggests that Dialogue is important regardless of position. Thank you so much. Thank you. 
Финальное выступление здесь, в Москве. Олег Геннадьевич Назаров, Олег Назаров. автор журнала «Историк», обозреватель. «Историан Магазин». He was a scientific editor of two of our compilations. Pre-war period, key, well versed in a period history. Dear colleagues, congratulations to a distinguished professor Michael and our, all of us with the publication of this great book. Joining all of the assessments, we won't repeat that. Fundamental challenge we are facing is popularizing this book and other works of Professor I mean, books and articles need to be promoted here and everywhere else. They are very useful for all of us, for the whole world. Everything we can do must be done to promote and popularize them. Considering a difficult, complex situation, in the West, fundamental work by objective Western historian to be widely presented. They are not interested in that. They want to keep it obscure. We have completely different goals and interests. As Veronica and Sergei mentioned in the forward, forward the book has a rare quality focused on the scholars and also wider audience. Another fundamental credit to the author. From my experience of working in a publishing house, most historians don't have this. And and certainly not many use the language clear for the wider audience. Our job is to adapt the narrative with everyday, clear, understandable language without losing the essence of the scientific fact. Michael Carlis books do have that rare quality. Our magazine is 10 years old, monthly publications. This month's edition announced us the book, short announcement, just a cover and a brief description. On behalf of our chief editor, Historian Magazine, I propose you give us an interview on the problems of the 30s, on your books, and also on the book that just saw light. Now, I think it will be useful to both of us. I understand the complexity of your situation, and certainly you uh, have to decide as to how how credible is this offer, how um, viable it is, but we will follow up if you decide. So, magazine turns 10 in November, and this October edition is dedicated to Brezhnev. It features an interview with Sergei Kudryshov, who you know well. Today, November interview with Gakuyev, Janen Kalchak, their relationship, intervention, which was also mentioned. Andre Sorokin's interview featured this year on the maps of war and pre-war years. 
Семендей you're going to be in great company is what I'm saying if you agree to give us an interview thank you so much for your work thank you very much Oleg a great proposal a great offer you can discuss it directly with Professor Michael that's about all from our side now we'd like to give you the floor to wrap up could you please tell us, when was the last time you've heard so much good about your work? I, uh... Your impressions about our discussion? Well, I... I... I'm speechless you know, I I'm I I'm greatly honored by uh, uh, your comments I I'm getting to be pretty old now I'll be 80 years old next year and uh, I, uh, I was uh, talking with my uh, spouse two weeks ago, and I asked her if uh, if she uh, how should I put it? I I um, I kind of wondered whether I had. Uh, 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 all the work I've done as a historian was uh, was uh, worth all the effort and all the sacrifices and all the sitting in this little room by myself uh, uh, working alone tapping, typing, uh, writing for years without anybody uh, knowing uh, what I was doing. And uh, listening to you all today, uh, I think... Uh, I th <clears throat> Well, I think I got my answer. I, th I think uh, I wish I, I could. Uh, it was easier for me to uh, come to uh, to uh, Moscow and uh, <clears throat> and spend time with you and uh, and you know talk and uh, discuss all these big issues. And I think you're right about uh, one thing. I, you know, I still, I'm still teaching. I'm teaching for the last time in the, in the winter term. And I, and I have a course that I teach on, uh, on the Second World War. And, uh, and I always, uh, in the first uh, lecture that I give to my students, I say to them, uh, you know, that uh, the study of the, <coughs> of the, uh, uh, of the history of the Second World War isn't just about history; it's about uh, it's about politics and the use of history as a political tool uh, in the West to uh, <clears throat> to use against the uh, well, to use in the first place against the Soviet Union and then uh, against uh, uh, the Russian Federation and. Uh, the, my students, uh, you know, they, they're just young kids. They don't, uh, you know, they're not uh, very politically aware, and it comes as a great revolution, re uh, revelation to them. And they, you know, some of them have an open mind, and of course, some of them, some of them don't. Uh, 
Uh, it's just I, uh, it's just uh, I, I just I'm I'm without words. I don't know what to say I, except that I I I, uh, I can't say enough how much I appreciate your respect for for my work. It's uh, very uh, important to me <clears throat> and gives me uh, and encourages me to uh, to continue on. It's about all I can say. Uh, in response to the question about the pronunciation of my name, in uh, in Montreal it's Carlet, in the United States it's Carly. I remember uh, Sergey uh, uh, and I had a discussion about this many years ago when we were, when the, we were deciding how to spell my name in Cyrillic. So we came up with we decided we'd go with the French uh, Carlet. Um, anyway, if, uh, if you'd like to, uh, you know, do interviews, that kind of thing, I'm very happy to uh, cooperate with you. And uh, as for the archives, I, uh, I don't know whether I'll be physically able to do the work uh, that I've uh, done in the past in Moscow, but I certainly, uh, encourage uh, the, the uh, continued publication online of uh, important uh, Soviet documents uh, uh, because uh, I don't know how many people in the West realize how important they are, but uh, uh, I've used them extensively as, uh, uh, as you will notice in volume two and, and volume three, uh, the, uh, the online, uh, in fact, the online documents allowed me to um, give greater depth of field uh, to uh, to my understanding of what was going on because I had not only the uh, uh, the archive the papers from uh, from uh, from me but I also had access to uh, to uh, uh, papers from uh, Soviet military intelligence uh, uh, from the commissariat for defense uh, and so forth and so on uh, I, th I think when you get to read uh, volume three, you will um, you will and see how you will see how important those documents are. And I, I only wish that I could accept uh, uh, the uh, invitation of Gaspardin uh, Romanov to uh, to return to uh, to Moscow. I, but I'm not quite sure whether my health will. Uh, will permit me to do that. But I, and I want to say how much I appreciate the, uh, the invitation. I think that's, I, I think that's all I can say at this point. Um, big thank you. Everything you heard today was well-deserved. For decades, decades, united in archives, sitting alone in your office. Hard to imagine that perhaps millions of people of all generations in the future will read it. Your truthful view of history, difficult to imagine. I think I told you, you make each day historic work. We are proud of you. Thank you so much. Thank you. And if you ever feel down, watch the video hear everything colleagues said about you and you'll feel better. You can listen to this every day. <laughs> Mr. Sorokin would like to say something else. Another proposal. We publish a unique historical archive magazine first 
publications of archive documents with author's comments. If you are ever interested on doing a case study on little less known documents discovered in the archives, the magazine is open. Sure. We'll be very happy to see you. I'd like to thank you wholeheartedly for the work presented here today and for the decades of work presented dedicated to the history of Russia and the Soviet Union. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Michael, видите, сколько вам работы предстоит? You see how much work you've got, Michael? So all the best of health. And also, thanks very much to your lovely wife who supports you. We can see her supporting you even now. A big thank you to her and all your family. Thank you. Thanks a lot. You're right. Uh, one other, well, maybe i say one last thing that uh, if, you you'd like, if you'd like to write to me uh, to talk about things we might, uh, I don't know, things we might do in the future, uh, please, uh, I encourage you to write to me. And you don't need to write to me in English. You can write to me in Russian if you like. Okay. No connection. Uh, we lost the connection. Вот видите, вы думали, что вы одиноки в профессиональном сообществе. Смотрите, сколько у вас друзей. You thought you were lonely, but you got so many friends and colleagues. Thanks a lot. Greatly appreciated. Ну что ж, мы на этом завершаем, коллеги. This will wrap up. I'll say goodbye to you now, then. Да, но будем по-прежнему на связи. We are still going to be in touch. You are with us, and we are always with you. Thank you. Yeah, thanks a lot. All the very best. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.